Welcome back to the Conscious Universe Review. We've finished looking at chapters 8, 9, and 10, the God-inspired chapters, and they were atrocious, absolutely awful. Possibly the worst thing I've ever read, especially the summary of the Big Bang in chapter 8. That's going to be hard to top. But anyway, now that we've covered those, we're circling back around to the start and looking at chapter 1, which is not God-inspired, this is Almondo original. Should we expect it to be better or worse? I'm not even sure. I'd bet on exactly the same. Except the Big Bang part, that's going to be the worst thing in the book, no doubt. Welcome! If you happen to be reading this book... How would I not be? This has reading this sign is illegal vibes. The order of the letters creates what we know to be as words. He likes to refer to things with what we know to be as. This happens several times throughout this book. These words don't fit together the way you seem to think they do, man. They seem to present a formula by which we can logically understand. They seem to demonstrate a pattern that we recognize as something that makes sense and correlates with our systematic reality. Yeah, we created our languages with the intention that we could understand them and use them to transmit our thoughts to each other in ways that would make sense and, when applicable, correlate with reality. One would have to assume... A very dangerous start of a thought for Almondo. In order for these things to properly correspond with the human mind logically, there would have to be some necessity of an external source by which we are capable of receiving and knowing what aligns with truth, logic, and order. So in order for words invented by human minds to properly correspond with the human mind requires something outside the human mind. That's what these things refers to, right? Words? That's the first part. As for the second part, you say there's a necessity of an external source to basically help you know what's true. Which, of course, there is. It's reality. We observe reality to know what's true about reality. We create our words to describe regularities we see in reality. And in order to be able to use those words to communicate ideas to each other in some sort of effective manner, we create, to some extent, logical and orderly grammatical systems, because when we don't do that, we don't know what the hell we're talking about. You're treating this like it's some grand mystery. It's not. How could you read the words on this page without some sort of immaterial guidance, mind, or standard of intelligence, consciousness? I have a mind, and I have consciousness. What are you talking about? I think these processes run on material hardware. If you want, you can describe the processes themselves as immaterial, in the same way that the Google Doc you're writing in is immaterial. But in both cases, the immaterial is the product of the material. Mind and consciousness are products of a brain. They don't require that there be some other entity out there with a brainless mind delivering its thoughts into our heads or something. Not only does that bear no apparent resemblance to reality, it proposes something completely outlandish and never before observed. Nothing like that has ever been observed, a mind with no physical basis. So I'm not just going to accept that that's real, let alone necessary for any minds to exist. In order for these things to make sense in a world of consciousness, logic, order, truth, or intelligence, there would need to be a standard of such things. And by these things, you're still referring to words, right? I think. I assume we are. You've given me no indication that the referent has changed. But if that's the case, then the next sentence doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It all begins somewhere. One being, one eternal source, one immaterial outside force by which we faithfully receive the perfect measurements of each value. And suddenly it sounds like we're talking about a measuring tape. The word value there makes no sense in any relevant interpretation I can think of. And that's going to be a regular occurrence through this book. But do you see why I was confused about whether we're still talking about words? Words don't have or need an eternal source or an immaterial outside force. They're tools made by humans to serve human purposes. So if we're not talking about words because this makes no sense in relation to words, what else could we be talking about? Certainly not consciousness, logic, order, truth, or intelligence, since it was very clearly stated earlier that we're talking about the conditions under which these things can make sense in a world that has those features already. But those were my only guesses as to what we're talking about, if not words. The origin of minds, or some reality with enough order to be comprehensible to minds. But since all those options have been preemptively excluded, I'm out of ideas. Somehow I think we must still be talking about words, even though that makes no sense. Because this page is so horribly written that it's nearly, if not totally, incomprehensible, I guess I can only summarize the argument as 
something, therefore God. How can I possibly remain an atheist now? It's ironic that his whole premise is that words, quote, on this page, quote, present a formula by which we can logically understand and, quote, demonstrate a pattern that we recognize as something that makes sense and correlates with our systematic reality, and yet the words on this page defy logical understanding because they make no sense. They do neither thing he claims they do. This is the first page of the first chapter of his book. I just feel I should mention that in case that wasn't clear. The big problem with today's society is that with all the scientific evidence we have that points to a beginning... Now, I haven't been mentioning all the incorrect uses of semicolons because there are just too many, but sometimes it reads so strangely that it's worth mentioning. Like, how is this the end of a thought that you had to join to another thought with a semicolon? I think Almando is one of these people who thinks semicolons are just there to look fancy. They actually have their own purpose, you know, that's why they're a separate piece of punctuation. Today's society does not accept logic. And now there's an incorrect colon. Rather, they accept anything else that does not include God. Another pointless semicolon. He's really going all out right now. No matter how illogical or unrealistic their arguments sound, they are quick to grab it and go with it. Cool. I wonder if he'll present any of these arguments they make so we can see that he actually knows what they are. To start with, maybe he can talk a bit about arguments on the topic of where words and language come from and why these things make sense to us. Most will say that if God exists, then they will believe. And then there's a correct usage of a semicolon. Wow. But the moment you take them into deep waters and provide the evidence, they become stone cold and reject that there's any evidence and are quick to turn on you, becoming hungry wolves that haven't eaten for months, ready to devour what is left of you. Wow. That was visceral. Man, it's just arguing on the internet. You don't have to take it so seriously. Anyway, what's the contradiction supposed to be exactly? People say if God exists, they'll believe it, and your evidence fails to convince them. And apparently they also maybe say meanie words or something. So if someone is honest when they say that they'll believe something if it's true, or more accurately, if they're convinced that it's true, that means that they also must accept any evidence, regardless of whether they consider it good or not, or compelling or not, and also they should never say a rude word about it. And otherwise they're being dishonest honest about their motivations. But what if your evidence just isn't as solid as you think it is? Because see, I know you think you have really good evidence, and so you think that leading people into those deep waters should lead people instantly to God. And so anyone who doesn't convert as soon as they hear what you have to say can't possibly be honest. But there's a chance that despite your feeling of certainty that you have all the answers and it's perfectly clear, maybe you don't, and maybe it's not. Maybe your evidence isn't really that great. There's just a chance of that. You know, when people ask for evidence, they're not just asking for any old random thing. They're asking for something compelling enough to convince them, to compel belief. But what you provide in this book only compels laughter. You see, the problem isn't God. The problem is their hearts. Or maybe it's neither. Maybe it's you and your evidence. But hey, I've only seen all the evidence you've given across, like, dozens of your videos and two of your books. So, you know, what do I know? It all begins somewhere. But where does it all begin? Who began it, and why? Are we capable of knowing these things? Well, I believe that we are, and I believe that we have. Yes, he believes that we are capable of knowing these things, and he believes that we have capable of knowing them. His definition of Big Bang Theory, stolen from Merriam-Webster without credit, even includes Compare Steady State Theory, despite that not being part of the definition, but a suggestion of a related term. I don't think he understood which part he was supposed to copy. Now, this kind of plagiarizing of definitions happens a lot through this book. Just by the count of occurrences, this is probably the most common form of plagiarism here. But now look, if the book had a definition or two that came from a dictionary, but you didn't mention that fact, I wouldn't be too hard on you. In Shmuel Pollan's book All In For God, he had a line that came directly from a Wikipedia article without attribution, and I pointed it out, but I just moved on afterwards, because that's the kind of thing that I can easily attribute to absent-mindedness, or ignorance, or just a mistake. Something missed in editing, or something you copied in just as a note 
note to yourself and then you forgot where it came from and you thought you wrote it and integrated it into your writing and you know writing is hard it's complicated things get mixed up sometimes i almost did something like that myself recently i was recording a video without a script and while i was recording i went and looked up a definition on dictionary.com and read that out and i intended to put an image in showing it was from dictionary.com but i forgot to do that and then i put the video up on patreon for early access and then later i realized that i didn't have the image there and luckily i had to do some other changes to that video so i had the opportunity to go back and put the image in and re-upload the video before i published it and i did that because i wanted to make it clear that that definition was not original to me it's entirely possible that i've missed stuff like that in the past i hope not because it makes me look like a dumb asshole but it's not something i do regularly and certainly not intentionally and if that was what seemed to have happened here i might mention it but i certainly wouldn't have much negative to say about it but that's not what we're talking about here this is not a case of a single mistake this happens extremely often through this book and you either very rarely or never i'm not exactly sure which mention that your definitions come from elsewhere that makes it very difficult to look past. Scientifically, we have come to a conclusion that the universe indeed had a beginning. Very debatable. But why is it that we stop there? What prevents us from going a bit further back to discover what actually caused the universe to exist? You say that like it's so easy. Like, well, you know, they figured this out, why can't they just go back to before the universe? Surely that can't be that hard. Especially with only observational science. Remember that? Evolution's just a theory based on observations. You didn't observe it actually happen. But then apparently discovering what happened before the universe is just, eh, yeah, just do it. It's not a big deal. What's preventing it? Can you pick a standard? But so, all right, Elmondo, it's so easy for you. Please, enlighten us. How exactly do you propose that we do it? What is this easy method you expect people to use to discover anything about an unobservable something where space, time, and the laws of physics will look very little like what we're familiar with? A point earlier than which there is no remaining observable effect. Please, O oh Veil Nebula-brained Great One, inform us. Now, saying that it's difficult is, of course, not to say nobody's trying. There are people who investigate the cosmogony of the universe. But as we've seen in Chapter 8, when they present a hypothesis about what things may have been like during the period you're interested in, and how the universe came to be as we know it, you ignore it completely, and make up some ludicrous thing that bears absolutely no resemblance to it, and claim that's what they said instead. So your question, clearly, is not honest. You have no interest in going back further to discover anything, scientifically. You'll reject every discovery out of hand without so much as glancing at it or trying to understand what it even is, because you only have one interest, and it's not in discovery. I believe it's the fear of a godlike being. Exactly, that's what I mean. Only one interest. He says that immaterial values, such as logic, order, design, truth, consciousness, morality, time, space, matter, emotions, thoughts, and minds, had to have a source that possesses the same values. He really, really likes that word values, but he doesn't seem to know what it means. He also likes the word immaterial, but he doesn't seem to know what that means either, since matter was in the list of immaterial values. He also likes really long lists of stuff. If evolutionists wanted to argue that we developed these values through the process of genetic mutation and advancements of DNA progression, then not only do they have to explain how evolution is capable of possessing these values whilst still being unguided and unconscious, not God, inappropriate semicolon, it doesn't become correct just because you have the word but after it, but also why it developed this way. This idea comes up a number of times in the book. The assertion, of course, left entirely unjustified that a cause must have all the properties of all of its effects, and the effects of those effects, and so on forever, no matter how distant or emergent said effect may be. So for example, my example, not his, if gravity causes an egg to fall and break, then gravity must have the property of having a broken shell and a splattered yolk all over a kitchen floor. And if the broken egg then causes a man to slip and fall on his ass, gravity has the property of a sore ass. And if this man was rushing to the emergency phone to tell the Russians that no, 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 it's not a missile, don't launch the nukes, and now it's too late, gravity has the property of World War III. You know, the immaterial World War III. Can you point to a World War III molecule? I didn't think so. This is no more absurd than the assertion that evolution must itself have morality or consciousness just because it forms part of the explanation for them. 
Almondo never bothers to argue for this in this book, as you can see by the fact that we've only just started chapter one and he's already taking it for granted. And yet, despite never arguing for it, he uses it as a fundamental premise for many of his arguments, as if it's just obviously true and everyone reading will agree with that. Also, I shouldn't have to mention this, but nobody proposes biological evolution as the explanation for logic, order, design, truth, time, space, or matter. Aside from maybe the order of biological systems and the apparent design in biological systems. But what he means is more that evolution is the explanation for order and design being possible within the universe at all. And in that sense, no, it's completely irrelevant to that. So evolution, the thing that's supposedly taken to explain the stuff on that list, is irrelevant to over half of them. It is at least somewhat relevant to consciousness, morality, emotions, thoughts, and minds, though. Hey, 5 out of 12 ain't bad. Okay, it's pretty bad, but it could technically be worse. Page 6 has some concerning questions. If these values were developed by evolution, why and how could we possibly trust them? And how is it that evolution gave some people the answer, but not others? I don't know what it would mean to trust space, time, or matter, but let's stick to the relevant 5 out of the 12. By trust, I can only assume that Almando means believe in the perfect infallibility of, so that he can feel confident believing things with absolute certainty. He loves that thought that he's got an infallible mind that's just perfectly trustworthy at all times. And so my answer is, that form of trust is stupid. Your mind is not infallible. You say ridiculous things all the time, so you clearly can't trust your mind to be right all the time, nor should you expect to be able to because that's just not realistic. Grow up and have some humility. You seem to keep forgetting that you worshiping God doesn't make you God. As for evolution giving some people the answer, what answer? To what question? And why would an answer be given by evolution? What are you talking about? Well, I won't get an answer to that question because page two just ends. Two lines in. Seems like the chapter's over. But nope, it continues on the next page, as a new section that could have just started here. Every other section in the book starts on the same page if there's space. Why is this one different? Just to be strange and confusing, I guess. This new section on the next page is called Are We Crazy? No comment. He starts with a nonsense sentence of random words and then ponders why this sentence makes no sense while other sentences do make sense. How do our minds recognize certain patterns of words and numbers? I'm getting flashbacks here. I feel like we already talked about this at the start of the chapter. And you would think if he wanted answers to these questions, he'd go pick up some books from the library on the psychology and neuroscience of language. But no, apparently this is the appropriate venue for this question. But a very basic answer without really touching on either of those would be that we learned a language that humans assigned certain grammatical rules to. And if you translated a sentence from some very very grammatically different language into English word by word, completely literally, it would probably make very little sense in English. But what he's written here would probably make very little sense in any language, because for example, the final part is swimsuit, cattleback, filet fish which is four nouns in a row with no verb. None of them are doing anything to any other. It seems like just a list. They also don't seem to be modifying each other in any meaningful way. Primarily, we made up language as a way to tell each other about stuff doing stuff to other stuff, or stuff being a certain way. Things that are interesting to humans. That's the function of language as designed. So he's intentionally putting words together in a way that goes against the human design and purpose of language. And then he's sincerely asking, why doesn't this seem to conform to the design and purpose of language as we understand it? Why doesn't this make sense to us? Why isn't it working? Well, why do you think? It's like trying to screw in a screw with a hammer and then asking why the tool doesn't work. How come we only respond to logical truths and order? Clearly we don't. This book is evidence of that. That's why we have concepts like logical fallacy, many of which are very appealing and convincing to people, and which they'll respond to as if they are logical. Who and what determines this pattern? The pattern of language? Well, we do obviously. The whole reason we made languages is to talk to each other about the world around us. Or anything else, really. Is it evolution? No. I mean, I think some of the underlying abilities of humans that allow us to have things like spoken language and written language are evolutionary, like symbolic thought. But as far as language itself, no. Unless you mean linguistic evolution, which you don't. Was it a random cause? No. 
If that's the case... Pretty sure that's not the case. Then that means not only do we have ourselves relying on random word patterns and order... Which, of course, we don't... But we also take away from an objective standard of truth and logic. What? If languages were somehow randomly caused and had random word order, that would seem to have no relevance to whether there actually is a reality, which is what objective truth means, or whether logic can apply to it. Whatever the cause of human language is, that has seemingly no impact on the existence or nature of broader reality. What the hell are you talking about? The moment we do that, we then find ourselves dealing with logical suicide. <coughs> okay, let's not then. We agree on that. For some reason you think we don't, but it's always been pretty clear that we do. I mean, when you watch my videos, do you get the impression that I think I'm relying on random word patterns? Do you get the impression from my username that I don't believe in logic? Just because I don't buy into your characterizations of language and truth and logic, or your explanations for them, doesn't mean I reject them. It means I reject your characterizations and explanations. But you're so intellectually arrogant that you can no longer even distinguish between the thing itself and your ideas about it. So if I reject certain ideas that you have about a thing, that's exactly equivalent, apparently, in your head, to me rejecting the actual things that you have an idea about. Because if you claim that there is no standard of logic and truth beyond humanity and or evolution... Which I don't claim because reality is the standard of truth, and that standard is what was observed to develop logic. You set yourself up by completely- I love you, logic. ...between your caterpillar eyebrows. Caterpillar eyebrows. Like Eugene Levy eyebrows. Who are you talking about? Who has caterpillar eyebrows? I've seen your face, I know you don't have them. You've seen my face, you know I don't have them. Judging by previous videos, you can't name any other atheists other than me. So who are you talking about? Not a lot of people have caterpillar eyebrows. So why did you say that? Is it supposed to be a joke of some kind? It doesn't come off as a joke, it just comes off as strange. As for the expression itself, shooting yourself in the foot would have made sense as an idiom. But calzon, calzon. the eyebrows has a very different connotation. I guess you meant to relate it to logical suicide, but it still just sounds... off. It's all very confusing. In order to recognize any sentence as something that makes sense or not, you need to have compared it to a standard of some sort. Exactly! Exactly! That's what I'm saying! To see if it's comprehensible as a sentence, I compare it to the rules of English grammar. To see if it makes logical sense, I compare it against the rules of logic of Aristotle and others, as well as the various fallacies pointed out by many others, and my own experience of what ways of thinking actually produce results that make sense, in accordance with reality, which I suppose is my own personal set of of rules or guidelines, maybe? All of these rules and guidelines are intended as a sort of device by which if you input some aspect of reality, meaning sound premises, true statements about reality, and you follow the rules we've designed, meaning you form a valid argument, then the device should pop out something which accords with reality. In essence, it's a method discovered or created, or however you want to put that, by humanity to predict reality in advance, similar to math or science. And of course, that's the ultimate standard. If I want to check my logical reasoning about the real world, then I'll compare the output against the real world. And if that output differs from the real world, then something's gone wrong. Either the premises weren't sound, or the structure of the argument was not correct, and therefore invalid, or possibly the tool of logic itself has a flaw, although in most cases that's exceptionally unlikely given its very good track record. So I trust the tool based on inference from its track record that it's generally trustworthy, but I'll also double check it, verify it against reality when possible. And at that point it's sort of verging into the realm of science. And by using this tool carefully, trying to ensure that it's being used in the way that has shown success, and by relying on reality as the ultimate standard to show whether it's succeeded or not, a lot of the human element that can lead to inconsistencies is mitigated, which really is the goal with these kind of tools. It's not to dehumanize it, but humans have foibles. Our minds are far from perfect, so these tools can help us compensate for some of those inadequacies. Does that clear it up for you?
He repeats his drivel about evolution and the immaterial values, and then simply asserts, Those values do not arise from the physical. Therefore, these values must come from an immaterial source, a source that provides these values from its own nature. Which, as an argument, amounts to, it's not physical, therefore it's God. Which, without the obvious prerequisite of providing any reason to think these values are not based in the physical world, Calzone. itself between the caterpillar eyebrows. I wonder what his reaction would be if I declared that I can prove God doesn't exist, and then used the same argument. It's not God, so it must be physical. There, I proved God doesn't exist. Yeah, I doubt he'd be rushing to deconvert based on that. A being with consciousness and a mind outside of creation itself would be the standard of all things. So if I'm thinking and reasoning about what's true and not true about the universe, I can't use the universe as the standard of whether my reasoning worked or whether what I believe about the universe is true about the universe. I have to look to a disembodied mind outside the universe. Why? Not only does that seem redundant, it seems less sensible. Either this is the conscious universe itself, or a being known as God who is the standard of all things. Either way, it seems to be that you still run into God. Well, no, apparently you either run into God or a conscious universe. You know, when I said that the title A Conscious Universe sounds a little bit like panpsychism, I was joking. But now it seems like that actually is what you meant. The conscious universe is a universe that's literally conscious as an alternative explanation to God. God's one option you'll accept, and the conscious universe is the other one. And then you made the non-God option into the title of your book. What a strange decision for a Christian apologetics book. The next section's called Not Enough Evidence. There's no evidence for God, but I also reject the evidence. Yeah, sometimes people say no evidence as a shorthand for no compelling evidence. And sometimes what you consider to be evidence actually is not evidence in any way. I can see how that'd be hard to comprehend for someone with a bargain bin brain. In order to make the assumption that there is absolutely no evidence for God's existence, there would have to be evidence for God's existence. Wait, so an assumption of zero evidence implies and in fact requires that there be greater than zero evidence. If someone has ever said there's no evidence, that means there must be evidence. How does that follow? Let me explain, he says, and then goes on to explain something completely different, specifically why it's silly to assume there's no evidence. And I'd agree, it's worth not being too absolutist about it when speaking precisely. If evidence is really just some piece of information that raises the likelihood of a claim being true by even the slightest amount, then there is some evidence for God's existence. Again, not good evidence, but evidence. For example, while testimonial evidence and feelings are really not compelling, the fact that that there are so many people out there who claim to have personally spoken with Jesus is evidence. Now, other, simpler explanations than God do a better job explaining that, and there's counter-evidence, such as the nature of the brain as concerns belief and emotion and memory and even hallucinations and dreams. Hell, there's even just the fact that people sometimes make stuff up. Recall the case of Alex Malarkey, the boy who came back from heaven. I called Malarkey on that one right away. But still, I'd say it's technically evidence. It's just incredibly weak and unsatisfying and better explained in other ways. And of course, if you're asserting that there is no evidence at all, that implies that there's also no evidence that you simply haven't heard of. Which may or may not be reasonable as an inference, but should be enough to at least, again, not be that absolutist. He says that to say that there's no evidence, you would have to fully refute every argument supporting the claim. Lastly, you would then have to refute every argument that supports that claim in order to know if the evidence is there or not. Key word, refute, meaning that you have to disprove and remove every fact of that specific claim. If it's not possible, then not only do we have a claim that could possibly be true, but we also have evidence that seems to support that claim, making it irrefutable until proven otherwise. This I reject completely, because as I read it, the assertion is that if a claim has any shred of evidence in support of it, even just as little as a single weak argument, and that argument just happens not to have been addressed or refuted by the standard of... 
well, I suppose Brain Lord Elf Dockings, then it's not only not yet refuted, but irrefutable until proven otherwise. A very strange turn of phrase that seems oxymoronic at first glance, until you realize that, of course, a claim can't be refuted before it's first refuted, or else that first refutation wouldn't be first. The previous refutation would be, and that's a contradiction. So if Elmando is taking prove otherwise as a synonym for refute, which he seems to be, then irrefutable until proven otherwise is not an oxymoron. It's just really dumb. Anyway, apparently this means that any claim for which every argument has not been completely refuted to this unnamed judge's satisfaction should just be presumed true until further notice. This despite the claim probably being only one among many claims, others of which may fit the evidence far better, and despite the fact that weak arguments of any quantity are not sufficient to warrant belief. Hell, there are many cases where a single strong argument is not enough to warrant belief because it may not be the only idea supported by a strong argument, and some other idea might have a stronger one. We seem to have another case here of the word evidence being given far more weight than it actually deserves, as if just any old thing in isolation that can be taken as vaguely pointing one way means that therefore the direction it points must be the correct way. No, it's cumulative, and the quality and cross-confirmation of all the evidence in totality and its applicability to one explanation over others is what actually matters. It actually matters what you have, not just that you have something. The really funny thing about him scolding people for saying there's no evidence for stuff, and telling people that saying there's no evidence constitutes evidence, and that if you haven't refuted every last argument for a thing, it's irrefutable, is his attitude towards evolution in this book. He asserts in this book that there's no evidence for evolution, which means, according to Almando, there has to be evidence for it. And I know Almando has not heard every argument for evolution, let alone understood them all, let alone completely and thoroughly disproven them on every level, in which case evolution is irrefutable until proven otherwise. Thanks for the acknowledgement, buddy. Didn't expect you to be saying evolution's irrefutable in this book, but you just did. Now he suddenly decides to examine the evidence for aliens and Bigfoot. This quote immediately follows the previous one. You may be thinking to yourself, how about all the claims about aliens and Bigfoot? Uh, no? Why would I suddenly start thinking about aliens and Bigfoot right now? Are these claims eligible to be possibly true because of its claims? Well, there is a possibility, but is it reasonable? Let us find out. I have no idea what switch flipped in his brain to suddenly put us on the fast track to Bigfoot Town, but now we spend four pages examining these claims for seemingly no reason. He has a list of questions that he's going to ask about aliens, Bigfoot, and God. They are. Can it be proven? Are there any effects of it? Do we have good reason to believe in it? What exponential evidence do we have for it? And have we seen anything that points to it that could be verified as true? Now before you say it, yes, exponential evidence is a meaningless nonsense term, at least in this context. My guess is he meant experiential evidence, but who knows. Now, you might think that all these questions sound like variations on just one question, which is, do we have evidence? And you'd be right. But the book's only 144 pages long as it is, okay? Aliens exist is not only invalid and not true, but a complete mess of a claim, Elmondo says, and then follows it up with, I do want to verify one thing, though. As a believer of the Bible as the word of God, we believe aliens to be fallen angels, demons. We don't believe the traditional view of aliens being that there is no evidence. No evidence. Zero. Remember what that's supposed to imply. But as far as demons and wicked spirits disguising themselves as what we may call aliens, we confirm that these are nothing more than demonic spirits and creatures. So there are no aliens. Not only no aliens, there's no evidence for them at all. But all those aliens you see, those are really demons disguised as aliens. But there's no evidence of aliens. It's just phenomenal. Anyway, to address the first question about proof, he says that extraterrestrial intelligent life forms that fly around in UFOs and have advanced technology have never been proven. None of these points have been descripted as evidence or discovered by any person. Alien life cannot be proven because aliens simply do not exist. It's a myth formed by the human man and the curiosity of what may be beyond us as far as space life forms. So the demons flying around in UFOs dressed up like aliens, that's not playing a role here? All right then. 
Well, I see how it works. Elmondo just gets to say, you can't prove it because it's not true. It's a myth because I said so. While asserting there's literally no evidence at all, which is what this whole section is meant to scold people for. He's just finished saying that to say there's no evidence of something, you are required to refute literally every argument ever made in support of that claim completely and thoroughly, and that otherwise the claim is irrefutable until proven otherwise. And yet here he refutes nothing, he addresses no argument for UFOs, and then he asserts there is literally no evidence, and that the claim is outright false and mythological. And man, you know if an atheist did that about God, he'd raise hell. But here apparently, no problem because he doesn't believe in aliens. The level of hypocrisy is staggering. About the effects of aliens, he just says there are no effects. I'm sure the UFO community would beg to differ on that point, and probably would have some evidence to show him, which he'd be obligated to refute by his own standards. If they applied to him and not just to everyone else, of course. Also, remember though, although there are no effects, the effects are from demons. Okay, just want to make sure you don't get confused. About whether there's a good reason to believe, he says, From the lack of evidence provided for alien life forms, it is safe to say that there is absolutely no good reason to believe in aliens. Right. Wasn't the point of this aliens and Bigfoot stuff to support the standard laid out at the start of the section? That you can't just say there's no evidence for stuff without being incredibly thorough? But all this seems to do is show that he doesn't actually believe anything he wrote there. Did he forget the point of this already? Anyway, about whether there's exponential evidence, he says there's no strong evidence, and there have been a bunch of TV shows and other stuff, but nothing in them has been confirmed. See, that's reasonable enough, I would say. It sounds like something I might say. Of course, it's possible that there is strong evidence somewhere that you just haven't seen. So again, if someone asks, do you really know that there's no strong evidence? Have you seen all the evidence? You don't want to be too absolutist, but the fact that most of the time people are bringing their best and their best sucks, I think makes it reasonable to say that there probably is no strong evidence out there. But I wonder where all the evidence of the very real and verified space demons is then. I mean, there's all these demons walking around dressed up like aliens, you'd think we'd have some evidence of that, right? About whether anything pointing to aliens can be verified, he just repeats that nobody's ever found any evidence. No aliens found, no UFOs, no alien technology, no evidence in space, and no evidence of their footprints traced. Wow. Well, since he didn't just address literally every argument presented for those ever, aliens are irrefutable. That's incredible. I didn't know that. The final conclusion to the answer concerning the existence of aliens is this. There is no evidence for their existence, or traces of their existence. Ah, so what you're really telling us is there are aliens. Wink wink. You know, it's funny how you're very careful to assert that there's literally no evidence whatsoever for aliens because by the standard you made up earlier, if there's any argument or any evidence that you haven't refuted that makes them irrefutable, and so you have to deny that there's even a shred of evidence, but the flip side of your standard is that if you assert that there's no evidence for something, that means there must be evidence for it, thus again, making them irrefutable. Man, you really got yourself stuck in a hole here, huh? Unless we are speaking about fallen angels and demonic influences, alien life forms are non-existent. Oh, so you get to assert that aliens are non-existent because you don't think the evidence is compelling. But when we do that, with regard to God, you'll raise hell and start talking about how unreasonable it is. Rules for thee, but not for me. But again, demons posing as aliens. There's evidence for that. Those exist. So anything that could be construed as evidence for aliens, you just redefine as evidence for demons because you want to, presumably including the evidence of you saying there's no evidence. But the evidence for these demons disguised as aliens would be exactly the same occurrences as if it actually were evidence for aliens, right? The demons are supposed to be making evidence that implies the existence of aliens, so these shows they're putting on are quite reasonable to take as evidence for aliens. That's actually the point of why they're doing it. So it would be evidence for aliens. Any reasonable person would look at this evidence and think it's evidence for aliens. So it is evidence for aliens. But then you say there's no evidence for aliens, so there's also no evidence for the Mr. Dress-Up Demons. Except, of course, you saying that there's no evidence for aliens, which requires that there in fact be evidence for aliens to say that, according to you. So the only evidence for demons flying around in UFOs dressed up like aliens is that you don't think there's evidence for aliens. 
That's it. There's literally nothing else. And this is confusing. Oh, and by the way, before we move on, this whole part gave me flashbacks. Isn't this what John Pendleton was talking about in Hello, I'm a Scientist 7? I didn't know anyone actually agreed with him. That's disturbing. Next up for this treatment is Bigfoot. There are many claims that people have seen these creatures roam in their own backyards. Huh. Sounds like evidence. Sounds like lame and weak evidence, but evidence nonetheless. But does that verify this creature's existence? Who cares? This isn't about verifying anything, it's about whether there's any evidence whatsoever. Remember? It's your book. This is all supposed to be supporting the claim that it's very silly and wrong to say there's no evidence for stuff. Which is why you keep saying there's no evidence for stuff. We currently today still have people who believe in the existence of Bigfoot with no evidence that validates their presence. Bigfoots bring presents? Oh man, I've never found this idea very exciting before, but now I want to believe! Please, someone, validate the Bigfoot presence! <laughs> so, same set of questions as for the aliens. Can Bigfoot be proven? There is no plausible evidence for Bigfoot's existence. Ah, no plausible evidence. That's a very different thing from no evidence. Okay, so but then there might be implausible evidence still. And you haven't disproved and removed every fact of that specific claim for every piece of evidence ever presented for Bigfoot, no matter how implausible. So the claim is irrefutable until proven otherwise. Enjoy living by the standard you've set out for yourself. I sure wouldn't want to. Are there any effects? Well, he talks about there were some big footprints found... Leaving behind unexplainable evidence of its presence. Which, yeah, I guess it would be pretty hard to explain how footprints are evidence of presence. Honestly, the only evidence of presence that I care about is unwrapping them myself, okay? But this only seems to be theories rather than evidential proofs. Uh, where to start? Evidential proof is not a thing. A theory is an explanation for a set of facts. It's neither evidence nor proof, nor should it be. And the footprints are the facts, or in other words, the evidence. If there are these footprints, they're evidence for Bigfoot. Now, I've looked at some of this evidence and found it humorously bad and far more easily explained in other ways, and I don't buy it for a second, but that's not the point. By which I mean it's not your point for fuck's sake, remember? Okay, do we have good reason to believe? Because there is no good evidence for Bigfoot's existence, there is absolutely no reason to believe it exists at all. I mean, there are reasons. Again, bad ones. But I agree with you, as far as I can tell, there's no good evidence, so we agree on that. But we're not talking about good evidence, we're talking about evidence. Good evidence is not the point of any of this. What exponential evidence is there? TV shows and documentaries, but also there's no exponential evidence. Can anything be verified? Even after all the research and investigation for Bigfoot's existence, there has been no good evidence for its actuality. Through all the hoaxes that were exposed and failed claims about seeing this creature in person, there has been absolutely no verifiable evidence that points to this creature being anything more than a made-up character. Aww, look at little Almondo sounding all atheisty all of a sudden. I mean, sure it's just Bigfoot, but it's a start, right? Bigfoot is a mythical legend. This being has been proven to be false enough times to abandon the idea of its existence. Proven to be false, eh? And how'd they go about that then? I thought you were all into this can't prove a negative type stuff. But here you are saying this negative's proven multiple times over. And now he applies the same five questions to God. Can God be proven? And then he spends an entire page repeating short versions of the same crap arguments he's used elsewhere in this book, so there's no point even mentioning them. You know what they are, or you will. All the ones he lists here are either based on the bizarre assertion that causes must have all the properties of all their effects, or they're just something that can be summed up with, uh, are there any effects? And then he has a Romans 120 quote and a bunch of my universe, my consciousness, uh, stuff. Typical. Is there a good reason to believe? Well, Jesus existed, don't you know? Exponential evidence? Science and history. Apparently that counts as exponential, so I'm not really sure now if exponential did mean experiential, in which case I'm not sure what it does mean. The evidence is endless, and with an honest investigation, you may find yourself running into a higher being 99.9% .9 every time. Insert Anchorman clip here. I probably won't though, because, you know. Can anything be verified? And he just mentions the stuff he already listed. 
God exists, whether we accept that truth or not. All the evidence points to God. And that's the conclusion of this in no way biased comparison, which, remember, was not meant to argue for or against the existence of these things, or even really the evidence, but to illustrate his claims that the assertion that there is no evidence is itself evidence, and that any claim supported by any evidence which has not been entirely, thoroughly refuted in the current work, including the evidence of asserting there's no evidence, becomes actually irrefutable until it's proven not irrefutable. That was the point, and Almando seems to have forgotten that entirely at this point, because he makes no attempt to try to tie any of this back to that, and instead he just moves on, satisfied somehow that he's shown that all the evidence points to God, in this tiny short section of his book, which is all about the evidence that points to God, which if that's the case, then the rest of this book is completely redundant and should have been a pamphlet. That would have made things a lot easier for me. The next section is about the universe coming from nothing. One major problem that atheists have is that the word nothing becomes redefined into something that apparently has the ability to cause an effect as big as the entire known universe. Is it? Do we have this problem? Contrary to what you appear to believe, atheism is not an explanation for the origin of the universe. Many of us, myself included, aren't even convinced that anyone has a correct explanation for that at this point, let alone that the explanation begins with literally nothing the way you're thinking of it. He defines the word nothing, and the definition is suddenly in Calibri for no apparent reason, even though the book is normally in Times New Roman. He just switches fonts sometimes because... His definition is just the one Google serves up, which he copied with no acknowledgement. As a matter of fact, it's two definitions that come up on Google. The pronoun version of the word nothing, as in I have nothing, or I know nothing, and an informal adjective definition, as in a nothing job, which is completely and totally irrelevant here. Anyway, to personalize his stolen definitions, he adds zero, nada, which ironically adds nothing. Now, according to scientific research, the universe seems to have come into existence from absolutely nothing. By absolutely nothing, what he means is no space-time, no physical laws, no quantum fluctuations, and so on, as he'll clarify in a second. And of course, no scientific research has demonstrated any such thing. I'd call this a flat-out lie if I thought he knew better. But now he has a quote from Stephen with a V. Hawking's, the author of A Brief History of Time, and evil twin of Stephen with a P.H. Hawking. Stephen Hawking says this, Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But wait, nothing means nothing! No single thing at all, zero, nada. So how could a law such as gravity create anything out of nothing? Now, you might ask, why is he talking about scientific research and quoting Stephen Hawking's evil twin in this section about a supposed problem with atheism? Well, I suppose the answer is because Hawking was an atheist, and therefore what he says is atheism. Or at least that's my guess. The quote is from the final chapter of The Grand Design, and it refers to chapter 6, which has a bit more elaboration. It refers to quantum fluctuations resulting in a universe of zero total energy because gravitational, quote, negative energy can balance the positive energy needed to create matter. So again, this is not nothing in the sense Almando's thinking of. It's nothing in the sense of zero energy, but there are laws of physics, there are quantum fluctuations, there's space-time. This is a very different sense of the word, and it's made very clear by the text that this different sense is what's intended, and Almando is equivocating these two senses, although he probably doesn't even notice. And how could gravity create if gravity doesn't have a mind or will of its own, or lacks the ability to make a choice of action? Why are you asking me? You've just cited a book that explains Hawking's ideas to you clearly enough. Surely you read it. And then he has a definition of create, which is also in Calibri, and for which he also stole the first two definitions from Google. So if gravity slash the universe can create, then couldn't gravity also be the result of life? If gravity can create a universe, then couldn't life make gravity, is what you're asking. How are these even related? What are you talking about? Why is so much of what you say just random, incoherent nonsense? Could gravity then acquire all the values of one's creation, such as consciousness, emotions, morality, justice, mind, will, order, logic, reason, design, act? 
Could gravity acquire that? No. Gravity is just a feature of space-time. It's just gravity. If something has those features or can acquire those features, it's not gravity, it's something else. But I guess you're implying that gravity is supposed to have caused all of those? Gravity didn't directly cause any of those. Gravity is a significant part of the explanation for why there's a sun and an earth and why stuff falls down. And if Hawking's correct, it's also the negative energy balancing the positive energy of matter, and that's about as much relevance as it has to the development of life. It's not the creator of life. But again, yet again, we see this entirely unjustified assertion that a cause must have every feature of its effect. He still provides no argument for this, he just assumes that everyone will take it as axiomatic. It's the furthest thing from axiomatic, Almondo. It's an incredible claim. And considering that it reduces to absurdity when it's applied to just about any cause and effect relationship I can think of, I'm confident in saying that it's outright false. In fact, that it's complete nonsense. And that's if your assertion is that the cause had all these features to start with. But even that is more sane than what you said. What you said was that the cause acquires the values of its effect after the fact. I can't even begin to express my opinion of that. If that's the case, then haven't we just discovered that gravity slash the universe could indeed be God? Well, that's one hell of a big if there, but either way, no. Gravity is gravity. The universe is the universe. Everything else is something else. I believe gravity is a created force within the universe, not a law outside the universe that supports the creation of the universe itself. Well, gravity is a thing of space-time, so of course it's within the universe. See, this is how I know that you've neither read nor understood the book that you're taking as your example of the atheist position. But if we are to play along with the atheists' claims, by which you mean the claims of some physicists, one of whom just happened to be an atheist, why is it always so hard for people to make these basic distinctions? We can clearly see that they are not only attributing gravity to God, but they are admitting that their own position self-destructs. So, let me get this straight. You didn't read a book by Stephen Hawking's all you know is that the words gravity and nothing appear in that book somewhere, and from this, you've deduced that atheists, generally, think gravity is the god of your religion, and we admit that this is a problem. Damn, that is some good mileage you're getting from doing fuck all. I should try doing fuck all more often, I had no idea it was so productive. Also, if the universe was created, then the universe couldn't have created itself because it didn't exist prior to when it was created. Uh, I agree. And so I think did Hawking. Hence why in the grand design he talks about universes emerging as a product of quantum fluctuations, not as a product of themselves. I understand that your quote mine is a little misleadingly phrased, but the context of the overall book helps clear that up. Again, if you want to criticize Hawking's ideas, maybe learn his name and read some of his ideas first, at least. Oh, and while you're at it, stop pretending that Stephen Hawking is just a synonym for all atheists. The next section is called If Not God, with a capital G, then God, with a lowercase g. I'm not sure what, if anything, the casing is supposed to imply. And the text suddenly changes to Calibri for two pages for unknowable reasons. Anyway, this is a list of features that he thinks the universe should have if God doesn't exist. And for each point, he says what the point is in bold, and then says something else about it in parentheses, and then after that also writes a sentence about it, but starting the sentence in lowercase as if the sentence started earlier even though it didn't. That sounds confusing, so here's an example. Created itself out of nothing, open parenthesis, despite the contradiction, closed parenthesis, lowercase t, the universe cannot create itself if it did not exist prior. That's a scientific impossibility. It's completely broken, and they're all formatted exactly that same way, so it's very intentional as well. Intentionally done that broken way, but probably not intentionally broken. I'll just run through the other claims about the universe and then mention a couple of interesting points, but I'm certainly not going through all of them, because we've heard it all before, and also it's two pages long and nobody's that interested. So the first one is that the universe created itself out of nothing, which of course is not implied by the answer not being God. It doesn't possess moral absolutes, it brought forth life, it established absolute truth, it brought forth intelligence, it established mathematical truths, it caused human feelings and emotions, it gave humans an immaterial mind, and it instilled the idea of God within us. Those are what the universe supposedly had to do if there was no 
God. And of course, all of this is supposed to be impossible without God. So basically, it's just Almando saying he thinks God is required for the universe to be how it is, which is a deeply uninteresting piece of information because that was entirely clear from the start. He doesn't seem to quite grasp the fact that there are other explanations on offer. Did he ever stop to wonder why that Hawking book had so many other words before and after the quote he used? Well, probably not, because I doubt he even knew there is a book. I'd bet money he just found it from this Institute for Creation Research article. In the Human Feelings and Emotions point, he says that feelings alone are a sufficient basis for morality. Feelings and emotions presuppose a specific standard by which humans should be striving for the greater good. Humans should feel happy, joyful, proud, comfortable, safe, healthy, strong, confident, ect. These feelings are good. Anything contrary causes harm, pain, sorrow, shame, torment, ect. And I agree. Humans' emotional reactions to events are sufficient to prompt us to develop moral systems. That's why we want to do it. Most of the point of a moral system is to achieve a given emotional outcome. Outcome. It makes perfect sense that humans would want to encourage behavior that makes us feel good, or that has an outcome that makes us feel good, and discourage behavior that makes us feel bad, or that has an outcome that makes us feel bad, because we have to feel the results. So this amounts to Armando tossing the moral argument for God in the garbage, and recognizing morality for what it is, a tool used by humans to serve human purposes and emotional needs. But then he immediately contradicts himself by saying that there must be a standard beyond us to do this for us, thus denying everything he just said. You know, these times where he seems to see reality for just a couple seconds before diving back under are always really interesting to me. The explanations given against God seem to presuppose God. Please. You don't even know what any non-theistic explanation for anything even is. That's been made incredibly clear by every chapter I've gone through so far. And your other book, and your videos. I have no idea what anyone says, and I don't care to find out, but I know it presupposes God. That's what this amounts to. Either way, God still exists. It just depends on whom you look to as God. Right, so you mean either God exists or you'll call something else God, like gravity, and pretend you calling it that means God exists. But that still doesn't mean God exists, it just means some idiot keeps calling gravity God for some reason. He concludes the chapter by just reiterating stuff he said before, so that's it for this time. Thanks for watching, and if you would, please give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. And if you like these book reviews or anything else I do, please do consider supporting the channel. A couple bucks per video or per month is enormously helpful. And as always, huge thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, sign up to the email list, list.logict.com, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>